Uh, on, on the third page, I put a note there that uh, I need to step to the other. It says, most of the material for this presentation is taken from a seminar of the NLS, which is the Nula Canyon School of, of London, that took place in London from 2003 to 2004. And the main analysts presenting were Jean-Louis Gold, the pronoun, Alexander Stevens from Brussels, I don't know if you know him. No. Vicente Palomera from Barcelona, Pierre Gilles Vigain from Paris, and Pierre Nivo from Paris. Really all very important analysts. They are not necessarily, I mean, they are not, exactly speaking, the collect group, but they are excellent analysts. Uh, <coughs> And as I talk, I just I invite you to interrupt any time that you want, because otherwise I can keep, I can keep going. You know? And but so just interrupt because that will help us. The other idea I talked to Gabby, and I told her that I had a lot of material. I said, "Well, Macario, maybe you, you can have one more or two more presentations." I said, "Well, that's up to the group. I I don't want to take away the turn of anybody, but if people are interested." Uh, this is such a fundamental thing because it's basically about the fantasy and understanding how fantasy works in treatment and in the life of people. Uh, I have learned a lot studying these articles, uh, just a tremendous amount. Uh, I guess the last thing I want to say is, Wilfred, since you are our resource here, you are the philosopher, and I'm going to be daring to go into the uh, philosophy arena, you need to help us. See, I already gave it to the next generation. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can add, correct, you're or whatever you know. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're the expert, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so, Lacan takes this to writers and important uh, people, uh, the, the German philosopher Kant and the French uh, philosopher, writer, aristocrat, and given to the, you say in English debauchery, <laughs> yes, yes. debauchery and and license and, and the kind of a rebel. And it, there's something very important with these two writers. It's a sort of kind of monster by mixing the philosopher of respect, the philosopher of morality, the moral law, which is Kant, mm -hmm. with uh, the, the philosopher of jouissance. Uh, and In French, did he already use jouissance? Or c'était plutôt plaisir? Uh, or both? I think he, they are both, at least from the article that yeah, I read yeah, about, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the, we need to say this in the time that this is right just a three or four or five years after the French Revolution. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind, you know. And so Kant publishes his critique of practical reason, I think it's 1789, something like that. And 1795 or 97, I forget which one, uh, Sal, uh, Publishes is a philosophy in the boudoir, which in English they translate as philosophy in the bedroom, mm -hmm. but that is not a good translation, bedroom for boudoir, because boudoir is a room that is between the living room and the bedroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. But in, in English that is there. <coughs> and it has a whole history there about that, which we won't get into. Uh, <coughs> and so let's start with, uh, well, Lacan takes the fundamental maxim from Kant and then uh, gives us a fundamental maxim from Sal. It's not exactly what Sal says verbatim, but it is strictly what you can infer from the way how the actors, because these are plays that are presented in public, 
a, a um, horrendous place. Uh, and uh, he takes these uh, stories, this, and then he infers from that the basic Sadi and Maxi. And so let's start with those two. So, Kant's maxim is act only on that maxim for which you can at the same time will that it should become universal law. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar to the Christian maxim, you know. You love that neighbor as you love yourself, or something like that. It's not exactly the yeah. same. See, the big difference is that uh, it is uh, an existential thing for uh, Jesus. For Kant, it is purely logical. Absolutely. So, uh, mm -hmm. we can have as maxim, as rule, if I like to open the door, I'll open it. If I like to close the door, I open it. Uh, if I like to kick someone because I am angry, I do so. And so now, says Kant, of all those little principles that I have, which ones can I accept as moral? Those which I can make universal. Mm -hmm. So if I have a neighbor and he feels like kicking, if I say I like to kick, then I must let him kick too. So, no, no. <laughs> so that, that is a purely logical Absolutely. thing mm -hmm. as opposed to an existential appeal of uh, right. Christianity with an universal thing too. Right. Yeah. 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 That, that, I mean, that's exactly one of the things that we're going to say. So, so Kant's maxim is a purely logical. Yeah, so he's going to talk, this is, and what Kant says is that to be able to have a maxim that has ethical value, you cannot let the object enter into it, any object. No affectivity, no pleasure, is what you were saying. Uh, nothing of that kind of satisfaction, because once you let that come into, you are unable to give a principle of ethics that can apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's fundamental in Kant. He calls that object and that subject that feels that has pleasure and so forth, a pathological object. But you need to know that he's using the word pathological not in the same way that we use pathological in psychology or in the clinic. It's simply the pathological subject for the pathological object is the one that is endowed with feelings, affectivity, pleasure, emotions. Mm -hmm. That has to be disregarded, as Wilfred just said, if you are going to have a principle of ethics that can govern universally how people should conduct their actions. Is that clear? And uh, just to add, see Kant became a philosopher after the success of the natural sciences. And so this universalizable principle uh, in morality uh, gives it a scientific kind of right. justification. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and he calls that an imperative. But it's an imperative to get to the sovereign good. The sovereign good is the ethical values. And I forget, when I was reading something of Kant, he said that there was nothing so extraordinary or striking as looking at the stars on a clear night, and then the other thing is about the ethical aspect the of human, of the voice of conscience. It is, it's a fascinating uh, philosophy. Uh, so that's the central maxim of Kant. Uh, and then comes Sad's maxim. And here's what Sad says. I have the right of enjoyment over your body. We need to stop there. Because then the next phrase is it's a, it's a strange match in the way Lacan puts it together. But I have the right of endowment of enjoyment over your body. Anyone can say to me, 
and I will exercise this right without any limit stopping me in the capriciousness of the exactions that I may have the taste to satiate. Jesus. That is the <laughs> And then, it's not and, Jesus. And listen. <laughs> not Jesus. No. And then, in 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 a human way, to say, it is talking to the French. Frenchman, one more effort, meaning the human rights have been just adopted by the French Revolution. So he says, here's one, one more that you need to pay attention to, that you need to take, is the right to enjoy in any way you can. But let's look carefully at this maxim because it's a tricky maxim. <laughs> yeah. I have the right of enjoyment over your body. Anyone can say to me, so Lacan says, this is in the article, this I, I have the right to enjoyment over your body. Anyone can say to me, meaning anybody, everybody in the whole world can say that. Mm -hmm. Consequently, I am quoting the big other. What everybody says, there is a principle of satisfaction that anybody can say to me. So, this is crucial, we need to understand. I have the, the right of enjoyment over your body. Anyone can say that to me. And I will exercise this right without any limit stopping me in the capriciousness of the exhaustion that we have, etc. So, in Kant, the principle, the duty comes from within, is the voice of conscience. Inside, the principle, the maxim, comes from outside yes. from the other. I have the right of enjoyment over your body. Anyone can say to me, meaning it's there, I am quoting what anyone can say to me. So you see immediately a, a drastic difference here. One is the vo voice of conscience, the other one is the voice of the generalized other. Uh, so with those two maxims there to start, then we go to Kant to kind of talk a bit more about his maxim. So Kant is talking about the sovereign good, about finding a rule of action that can apply to everybody to get to the sovereign good. In the process, he makes a big distinction which both the German language and the English language have, which is the distinction between Gute and Wohl. Gute is good. Wohl is the good. Wohl is pleasant. Uh, Well-being. Be well Well-being, but it's not the good. So there's a distinction between the two, Gute versus Wall, Wall. And then in Kant we also have a will. With this maxim, act only on that maxim for which you can at the same time will that it should become universal law, will. Once I know my ethical position, you must will you repeat it, will that act or don't will that act? As you were saying earlier, I can open the door or not open the door, this or that. But so there is a will included with that. Uh -huh. But this, as, uh, as we already said and as, and as Wilfred was emphasizing, this is a logical imperative. It's an abstract imperative. It is not an existential. And so we begin to see what is the problem with Kant's moral law, is that the object, the body, feelings, vitality is not included. It's a universal abstract law. 
And so I put the subject of ethics versus pathological object. And so pathological object is the one that involves feelings, pleasure, uh, attraction, attraction, all of those things. And so comes the next thing that all of these are, are concepts that are in the, in the article by Lacan, by the way. I'm just I have taken them from that and from the writings of this analysis. So it would appear, says Lacan, as if there is no object in Kant's philosophy of uh, the moral law. But he says, let's look at it carefully. And he has beautiful ways there how he says it. He says, because the object is there, but it is hidden. Uh, how is it hidden? And he said, when you read Kant, and you have this passionate pursuit of this pure subject of ethics, what is that? The object of satisfaction is there hidden underground that he doesn't acknowledge. You know. But it is there. That and is very interesting because the uh, uh, normal interpretation of Kant is that uh, you are really moral if you follow uh, the universal law, particularly if you are in pain. If you enjoy it, you are not certain whether you do it because you enjoy it or the moral law. And so uh, uh, for Kant, uh, the criterion of your morality is your pain that you act on logical principles against your desires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he states very clearly from the very beginning that if we are going to have a maxim of ethics that can apply to everybody, you have to disregard feelings. Yes, yes. Uh, and so naturally, pleasure and so naturally, forth. Lacanian reading would be what is the pleasure of following the reason? Mm -hmm. the, right. That's basically right. what uh, uh, Kant is doing. Right, exactly. And, and that's what Lacan and, is saying. And, that, and he doesn't stress that uh, Kant. Right. But, but, uh, that would but be it is there. Lacanian reading of, of Kant. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, Lacan reads that and says the passion is there. It's just underground. But it is, yeah. what, it is what is fueling this pursuit of this pure ethics, you know. Uh, so uh, Kant is looking for a pure subject. A subject with no impurity, with no, no pathological subject, which again it means emotions, pleasure should not be involved. The body. Yeah. And, and, body. and all the impulses that come and attractions that come from the body. Absolutely. And so the question then is where's the vitality in that process? You know? when the subject is completely denuded, would you say? Denuded of all of these things, you know. Uh, so for Kant, he's dealing only with the symbolic, with the signifier. That is the law for good. And so now we take sad, which is exactly on the other side. And so in Kant, this is an imperative. But it's not a commandment. It's not exactly like the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, it says you should do this or you should do that. Kant says, this is the maxim. You choose. But if you're going to choose and you want to be ethic, this is what you need to do. But it's a little different from commandment, from the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is you do this, you do that, 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 that. And now comes Sad. And Sad says, for Sad, this is a declaration. It's a declaration of rights. Well, it's a universal right. But as I said before, what is very important in this maxim, I have the right to enjoyment over your body. Anyone can say to me is that this I speaks for the other, for the big other. 
And so the I becomes the other of the other. Something that is impossible. There is no other of the other. But the way he puts this into this right, he says, I'm simply acting, quoting what is there to conduct my life. And this principle is what we have read. I have the right to enjoy my own body and so forth. Of course, immediately we can see that as quotation marks, because this is quotations, as idealistic in an evil way this is, of course, this would be something that is absolutely impossible to make happen in any society. It's not simply bad. It's simply impossible. Because if everybody has this right, you know, it's, it's, it's simply impossible. You cannot have a society where this maxim could be in operation. But if you, if you think of it, could you not say with limits is permanently effect, uh, uh, in effect. But where are the limits? Well, yeah, yeah, but there are limits. But no, no, but, 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 in, but, yeah, but in such maxim, there are no limits. Yeah, no. He, he, he says it precisely, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, See, without yeah. any limit to stopping me. See, just to give an example, I uh, drove my car, I see there's someone walking, I say, do you want the ride? Uh, yeah, maybe it is all right. And he's uh, a uh, uh, Salvadorian. I said, do you sometimes work? Yeah. And uh, he comes now for helping in the garden and I pay him. So basically, I am using him. I pay him, but I, I use him. And now, the, the, the society wouldn't be able to work unless we use each other. Now, with the radical thing is with the that he said, yeah, yeah, and so, uh, but, so, the first thing is we use others, and then we, we have these limits that are flexible, and so, but, uh, well, so that, that is the point of no limit. Well, Sal gives a, a very interesting example. He says that somebody goes to the king of France, who's the ultimate authority, and tells him that he killed somebody for enjoyment. That what is his victim? And the king of France said, that's fine. I forgive you. You killed him out of enjoyment. But I will also forgive those that may want to kill you out of enjoyment. <laughs> That the king of France was pretty clever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was the king of France, but something that said, you know, this maxim has said Irony. Irony, yeah, right, yeah. Huh? But you touched there on something very crucial to this. How is it that uh, in growing up, uh, everybody within the limits of, uh, imposed by the culture puts limits on the enjoyment of the others. Right, because we will, well, because uh, the human being is a being that to be human, to live in society, has to move from the world of nature to the world of culture. Yeah, and and culture has all kinds of rules. Mm -hmm. And that's why Lacan laughs about the, the word freedom. They ask Lacan, well, what do you think about freedom? In, in that uh, film, I don't know if you saw it, but we had a film of, an hour film of Lacan, of him, you know. It's, uh, and, and in the interview, they're asking him, what about freedom? And he's going to say, freedom? Freedom? Well, freedom. Anyway, what he says is that the only free man is the madman. The rest of us have to be with our signifiers. Our signifiers make us, for better and for worse. And so freedom is very limited. It's within all kinds of boundaries and, and controls. 
So the voice comes from the outside of the subject. So there's the right to enjoyment and the right to satisfaction. But now comes something even more important. And we will get this more deeply into this with the fantasy in a little while. The object has a will in Sal is even more fundamental than in, in Kant. Because it will become more clear when we get to the themes of, of fantasy, but the will in Sad takes over the object. And you get under the will to satisfaction. It's not only that I want satisfaction. Behind that desire, there is a will that orders you to have satisfaction at any cost. And what Lacan would say, we will go over this again in different ways when we get to the fantasy thing, is that here the object because in the in the Salian maxim, the the subject takes the place of the object, not of the bar subject. Uh, that we we'll get to that. And that here, what we have is that the object is a piece of the real. Being a piece of the real means that that object of desire in the Salian maxim that is under a will. is not altered by any law, because it's a piece of the real. What is altered by law is only an object that obeys to the diacritical structure of the signifier, where one signifier defines is defined by another signifier. So you go from this to this to this to that. In this situation with sad, that object is rigidified. Uh, I think Lacan in the article used the word congeal, but it's the same thing. It's rigidified. It's massified. And it's a piece of the real. In being a piece of the real, it is unchangeable. It is unmodifiable. As opposed to an object that is subject to the diacritical structure, which is the structure of the signification. Signifiers. Are we following this? Mm -hmm. the, it, it, this part yes. is difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Um, it will. It, it is going to get more clear now okay. when we get to the actual examples in the in, in, in the fantasy. So we'll we'll get back to it now. Okay. I just wanted to get to this point, you know. And so this becomes the law for evil. And you can, because I was thinking this in the last week, we had this case in, uh, was it Oklahoma? What was the case of this? Mm -hmm. Newton. Newton. No, no. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a little bit, that, that could be more, I mean, I don't know, but that could be more for a psychotic uh, mm -hmm. subject. But I think that the case now of this guy that uh, kidnapped this kid oh, and no, killed yeah. the bus driver. Oh. And had the kid for five days until the FBI came in and wrote. My hypothesis is that this is exactly what Lacan talks about. This is a pervert. This is a, a, this is a sadic pervert, because this pervert, what and we're going to get that. What the pervert in the Salian fantasy is looking for, because he's in, he's in the real. He's a piece of the real. He wants to pass the bar of the subject to the other. And he's going to do that by inflicting as much pain as possible in the other. To get the, to get the other, the victim, in a total oscillation and render it to a pure abstraction, to a pure idea. that eventually falls into the real, so an identification with himself. But the process that the pervert uses, the, the sadic pervert, is to pass the bar of the subject to the other. He is not barred. He is not castrated, but needs 
to see the other castrated cut. And so I, when I was uh, preparing the, the summary here, I was thinking about this kid. And you think about, you can imagine the pain of the parents, mm -hmm. the pain of the community, and of all of those of us, you know, that thought about this kid five years of age. Mm -hmm. And also the bus driver was killed. And the bus driver. But here is somebody that goes directly for, that's the criminal. The, that goes directly for his reasons without any limits, you know. Uh, but what he creates in the other is exactly what these parents were feeling, the anxiety, the lack. The bar subject lacks. The real doesn't lack anything. It is, it is. So the pervert is a piece of the real, is saying Lacan. Um, yeah. And it's going to be a, a, even more clear when we get to the to the machine of the fantasy. But the paradox here comes the paradox. The paradox is that the says we all to sad that in his perverse way in his writings resurrected brought into the consideration of ethics, the issue of satisfaction, the issue of pleasure, the object. So what is missing in the symbolic of Kant comes in the real of Sartre. What is repressed in the symbolic returns in the real. Uh, because that reintroduces satisfaction. So these are two polarities, opposites. And from here, we will get into the ethics of psychoanalysis, which are neither one or the other. But the ethics of psychoanalysis acknowledge both sides, the, both principles. Not both principles, but the, the, the issue of satisfaction and the issue of the good. There is no word for the good in uh, sad. There is no word for uh, desire in sad. It's nothing of that sort. And now, uh, what, what, what is Lacan's maxim? Lacan's maxim is, don't give up on your desire. That is the good in Lacan. The good in Kant is, Act only on that maxim for which you can at the same time will that it should become universal law. Lacan is talking the good as desire is the good of each individual, of each subject. The good for each subject is connected with her, with his desire. And he's going to say that with can and with sad, then we can distinguish that in good, in desire, it may be pleasant, it may be unpleasant. It may be very unpleasant to hold your desire. You may feel bad in doing good, meaning you may feel pain in doing good. You may experience frustration in maintaining your desire. So desire, the good, doesn't necessarily go with feeling good. This seems so simple, but for me so fundamental because I have been for a number of years now very curious and really studying that and thinking about that is that in my training that is still very present uh, in, in American psychoanalysis and the way I trained was that it was very important with the patient asking me how are you feeling? Of course it's important But this is what I remember when we had the seminar here in Washington. What I presented was 
the tyranny of empathy. That was my page. Mm -hmm. The tyranny of empathy meaning that this rule that if you're feeling good or you're feeling bad, this is what you empathize with, is you have to be cautious with that. Because it is not feeling good or feeling bad that really dictates what the desire of the patient is. That is not necessarily connected to the desire. And that Freud taught us that what is repressed is the symbol, not the feeling. And that what we, what we need to get to is to the symbol holding the repression. Not that we should ignore the not that we should ignore the, the feelings and emphasize and so forth, but be attentive as therapists that that is not how healing is going to take place. Maybe support, yes, but insight, understanding, resolution, not necessary. And that's connected with this. I mean, when I, when I read this, I was saying, wow, here it is. You know. uh, And then I can will say also that the law, uh, it will present here as the <coughs> enforcer of this good is the law of the Father. That it is the law of the Father that protects the child, the child's desire, that interferes between the need and the desire, so that the child can begin to distinguish between need and desire. Need is one thing, desire is something else. Desire always implies lack. And then Lacan will explain that it's only through love that satisfaction can lead to desire. It is only through love that satisfaction can lead to desire. And love implies the signifier. If we get a chance, we'll talk about the sexual relationship and how he talks there here in this article and others, of course, about the sexual relation and, and something that I, I think I finally I'm beginning to understand this phrase that gets repeated and repeated that there's no sexual rapport. And, and I have been so many times that, yes, I understand, but then I say, no, I did it, no, I did it. And here, I think I finally got to understand it. So we may get to that. Uh, let's, there's a lot about the superego in this article. And Lacan's superego is Enjoy. And what is that? Because our notion of superego is always that the superego is the one that prohibits, right? Mm -hmm. It's the one that forbids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is that. But a very important dimension of the superego, and is the one that Lacan will emphasize, is that the superego recovers what it forbids through the enjoyment of forbidding it. <laughs> and that, and then uh, this, this panel is given a number of beautiful examples. One of them gives the example of Kenneth Starr and President Clinton. And says, oh, yes. and says here, here you have somebody that writes 500 pages <laughs> condemning President Clinton. And you can feel the passion, yeah. the enjoyment oh, yeah. in this whole process, you know. That is the superego, enjoy. That's the other side of the one that forbids. And of course what, and it, it, it answered, something was fascinating to me when that whole thing with Clinton was going on. I had like three men. And one of them was in all kinds of affairs. And one of them especially had some perverse traits. He was not a pervert, but he definitely had some perverse traits. This guy could not stand that Clinton had, uh, had sex with uh, Monica Lewinsky. He could not stand it. And the same thing with other two patients. And I said, how interesting. 
these people that are doing exactly that. <laughs> and what did we see in Congress? You remember that very important guy in the, in the, in the House of Representatives, which was vociferous about Clinton? And in about three or four weeks, they caught him. Yeah. That he, and he had to leave the House of Representatives. Yeah. There it is. So the superego enjoys, and that's what Lacan mm. stresses with the superego. Uh, and, and, and that is different from Freud. And, and, and Lacan will say, although I think Freud says, which is very close to that, uh, because I remember something that an analyst said to me in the Washington School years ago, that in many patients, the superego is very close to the id, not to the ego, to yeah. the id. Mm -hmm. That in a certain sense, the id is the next door neighbor to the superego. Mm -hmm. They can move from one to the other. Mm -hmm. and, and so these examples, you know. Another common example is the mother that sacrifices everything for her child, that completely Uh, forgets about her needs and everything for her child. And what can happen from that? That uh, uh, there's a beautiful, I don't know if any of you have seen, we just saw the Washington School of Psychiatry in the, in the weekend conference for the second time, this uh, Italian film, Si può fare, it can be done. It's a beautiful film. And in this film, uh, which is with mental uh, patients and so forth, there is this young man that is trying to leave his mother, and his mother adores him, and you know, and he can and so forth. Finally, through the help of this therapist, he leaves and so forth, but it's a struggle and so forth. Well, in the process, at the end, he commits suicide. He hangs himself mm -hmm. in the place where they, everything is going on. And then they present, the mother comes, at the, with a picture of her son and gives a picture of her son to all of the other patients except to the therapist. Like saying, you took him away from me. This kid hangs himself because he cannot leave his mother. The mother that sacrifices 100% for him, that's That's a case of the superego as well, but it's not of the superego in, in, in sadism. It's the, of the superego in masochism. And we can get to that because Lacan, different from Freud, will stress that the, that the machine for the fantasy for the sadist is exactly the same as the one for the masochist. For the masochistic structure, not for masochistic traits, mm -hmm. because we cannot have uh, perverse traits, whether sadistic or masochistic. It is very important to distinguish traits from structure. In, in the structure, the, the way the fantasy is organized is rigidified. There is no room for anything else. In the neurotic, there is room for perverse traits and for uh, other things, but it's not totally rigidified. Why don't I stop for a minute? So oh, this is that's a lot. And, and then we can get to the, the second page and see where. Macario, I would like to ask you if you could um, repeat that um, phrase the superego recovers what it forbids. Can you repeat that? The, the superego recovers what it forbids in the jouissance of doing it. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the, the example is Kenneth Stark. This analyst was saying, because they, they are all European analysts, and he said, it's so interesting. Uh, I, I saw 500 pages of Kenneth Star for what President Clinton did. And then there was something similar with Prince Charles in England. Mm -hmm. And in the paper there, were about, there was one paragraph about uh, a Prince Charles uh, affair, you know. He said, here's the difference. You know. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that so in this culture, culture where it does so much licentious and so forth, there's a very powerful, uh, severe, sadistic superego. Mm. A superego that says, enjoy, you know, 
enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's correct. See, I didn't I, I, I to confirm a statement that I read. Uh, there was someone who, who was preaching against uh, 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 going to a horse, and after he was finished, he ran off to a horse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, uh, another way of thinking, but yours is very provocative, another way of thinking is, to preach what you cannot do yourself. Yes. Uh, but the Lacanian and your interpretation. Not what you cannot do yourself. What you like to do, but not acknowledge that you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's another word for hypocrisy, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Scary. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. But but uh, in this sense, the hypocrisy is not a conscious hypocrisy. It's. Uh, a lift duality, whereas uh, uh, sophisticated people <coughs> can be hypo hypocritical and try to have it both ways, eat the cake and keep it. And eat it too, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Jesus. Any other? Well, another question is when you have these pseudo-masochistic patients, what are some of the things or is that what we are going to talk about? Yeah, we can get to what, that. What, yeah. what, 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 what because there are so many, really, so many fundamental clinical issues with this, you know. And, I mean, I have learned a lot, you know. I've been reading this for about two years now. This is not just now. But, mm -hmm. but in preparing for this, I went and reread mm -hmm. all of the articles I had read before. And um, what this leads is to the fundamental fantasy because there is in all of us a fundamental fantasy. Yes, and that fundamental fantasy is a piece of the real. Mm -hmm. It is not as I had assumed that it was more like, although one of the analysts here says that the fantasy needs to be looked at at the three levels, the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real, but that the fundamental fantasy is really a piece of the real. It's something that defies interpretation. But it's something that in Lacanian analysis is called the end of analysis. Where, uh, at, uh, at the end of uh, where Lacanian analysis, you have to confront the fundamental fantasy, which is that piece of the real that keeps coming back to the same point. And what the Lacanian analysis says is that it may not be interpretable but you may cross that fantasy. And how does that happen? It's very interesting. It says, to cross that fantasy, what you encounter is angst, anguish. Mm -hmm. And one of them gives a very good example. It says that that's what happens in adolescence. That in adolescence, the young woman, the young man, is enamored by this and that, and then you begin to have those breakups and the anguish when that takes place. Which is, you know, sometimes the, the kids are heartbroken. You know, yes. And that anguish indicates that there is some crossing over, that there is some resolution of that fundamental fantasy at some level. Mm -hmm. And in a more full way, that is what needs to happen in the Kahneman analysis. You have to get to that fundamental fantasy and cross that fantasy. And in doing that, you will have to meet some anguish, which is going to be different for each subject. But it's, a, it's an anguish that you can sustain, that you can bear. Yeah, and an anguish that frees you in some way. You know. It, 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 instead of keeping you rigidified with that, uh, you know, with those symptoms that never give up. But it's, it's, there's an insight, right? Yeah. The person has to have an insight of that. What is interesting in the karma really is that the insight precedes all of that. The, the insight has been happening and building up. When you get to that point, is that you get to a point of no return. You cross, it's, you cross it. It's like there's no more insight. 
And, uh, and another analyst talks about that as you get to a point of necessity. So you confront contingency versus necessity. And this is necessity. Something has to be faced. There's no choice. You know? And that's where the anguish comes. Is that the same as the horror that we Yeah. Is that a similar? Yeah. Yeah, it's similar. Uh, it's yeah. anguish that, that yeah. really. Some Lacan anal analysts speak of that as, a, as, a, a, as the horror of what has been holding you. Mm. And that if you can confront that and, 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 and trespass that or cross that over, then what we hope for is enthusiasm. Mm. And that in that sense, Lacan takes us further than Freud. Because what Freud, Freud stopped at what he called the rock of castration. He says, you get there and you cannot go past that. And Lacan will say, no. You get there, and that's fundamental, that you confront that piece of real. Mm -hmm. And if you confront the angst, the anguish, then you can, you can something else can happen. Uh, another analyst will say that when you confront the, the anguish, you can invent. Mm -hmm. There's an in inventiveness in you that it comes out you. of that. There's right. Is that what Lacan, the late Lacan calls the gay savoir? Yeah, yeah. The one, I'm sorry? The gay savoir. The gay savoir. Yeah, oh. yeah, 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 exactly. Because once you go beyond it, then you're free and you can accept your yeah. symptom. It's a transcendence, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because in that sense, you get the freedom that you know, Lacan was mocking in the, mm -hmm. in the interview. It's, a, it's that ability not to be held yeah. back. But it's a different kind of freedom. It's not the freedom that we talk about. We, because we keep being limited by all kinds of boundaries. Mm -hmm. As he said, the only free man is the madman. I, I think that's absolutely true. You know? But we handle those boundaries now in a different way. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the the, uh, the encounter with this piece of the real has an effect on one's uh, imaginary and symbolic, right. Uh, right. what's the right word, structure or something? Mm -hmm. so, that, so, that the, so that the, so we're, you know, you're speaking of a certain kind of agony or angst that, but, the, but, there, but there has to be, a, the, there is in some sense a transformation at the level of the symbolic yes. real. That's what I'm trying to. In, in a certain sense, actually, Brian, is. The way you said it is true, but it's actually even more so the other way around. Is that at that point, the symbolic and the imaginary act on the real. Uh, they penetrate the real to some degree. Uh -huh. Yeah, in a certain sense, they do. It's a, it's a metaphor because it's not the same way. But in a certain sense, they do what the scientist does, uh -huh. because what the scientist does with the formula of sciences, penetrates the real, brings out a, a formula which is symbolic, and then you can do all kinds of things. You can fly airplanes, you can do this, you can do that. But you need the formula, the symbolic. And then with that, you penetrate the real. You know. does, does that make sense to you, right? It does. I've, I've struggled with the notion of fundamental fantasy. You're stating it so specifically as a piece of the real. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's hard. It's hard stuff to make sense of. But the, uh, but um, so I, I guess I, in trying to make sense of it, I've always thought of it as I've just taken fundamental fantasy to to, to suggest that there is something visual or imaginary about it mm -hmm. and something symbolic, yes. but not symbolizable or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. So like it's made more sense. Like a, I, I'm trying to imagine the experience of the. You know of the, um, of, the fundamental of, fundamental. of crossing the fundamental yes fantasy. yes yeah. you know the, the theory gets really <laughs> but uh, I am with you Brian because I am with you Brian because all the time when I thought of fundamental fantasy I was assuming an image that's how I yeah uh, how I mean. and a phrase and with the symbolic and everything but the the core of the fundamental fantasy as I read all of these articles, uh -huh. is a piece of the real. Okay. Yeah. But 
And that's the objet of, which is... That's the object of. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's the part. Yeah. How does that relate to something else that Lacan uses, which he calls the unary trait? Mm -hmm. and the question, how, how does it relate? The unary trait is a partial solution to that already. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, the unary trait comes uh, after the father has a role in the child because the reference by the mother to the father and therefore triangulation is introduced and so the, the Lacanian argument is that for the first time uh, the linguistic dimension is existentially introduced in the child. I thought I was everything for the mother, psychoanalytic, I thought I was the father for the mother, but the father is elsewhere. So who am I? And so the search is then to find in the father the signifier that the mother likes to make the basis of your identity. What I would add, what I understand, and I may not have it, sure. but what I understand of the unary trait is that the unary trait is what in other uh, writings Lacan calls the one. The unary trait, the one. Is the one that is there, the one element, but can, that doesn't become part of the signification. It's not an S1 that ties with S2, S3, S4. The unary trait is prior. Mm -hmm. So so the unary trait is tied more to the language, mm -hmm. not to language. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how I, I understand it. The babbling. Pardon me? The babble right. of the, yeah. the baby. Yeah. Which would put it close to the real. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But it's close to the real, but on the way to the symbolic. It's, it's not quite the real, it is not quite the symbolic. It's another one of these. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the language, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at least that's the way how I understand it. That's, uh, you know. You want to move to the second page? This is uh, <laughs> necessary. <laughs> you tell me. I'm, I'm uh, not should I uh, refill the coffee? No. So let's uh, let's. Uh, then we're going to talk now about the fantasy more in detail, using using the perverse fantasy. And so we have on the left. I put these two lines. The reason why I put these two lines is because I made the first one it was so <laughs> it was so straight, so I put another one, you know. So it's wow. not that that's the way it is. You it's know, not so. an error, is it? Yeah, it's, it's an error. Yeah, straight a bit. But it's to keep the two things separate. You know? <laughs> so I have the right of enjoyment over your body. That is the subject of the statement. That is the utterance. Who is behind that? Who is the subject of enunciation? Who is the one that assumes responsibility for that? That's in the second phrase. Anyone can say to me, that is the subject of the enunciation. So you have the two. You have the subject of the statement, what is said, and you have the subject of enunciation. Who is saying that? In our group today, a group that Mabel and I conduct, this is an example from the clinic. Uh, a patient tells another patient, you can let go and still love the person that you let go. He said that to her a week ago. Two weeks before that, as we were talking, I asked him, what 
Why can't you let me go? That was my question to that patient. It's a patient that, by all indications, is functioning well, is retired. He, he works very well in the group. He, and so, I said, what makes it difficult for you to let me go? And he's very smart, and, he, and so he kept thinking. So today in the group, he says, there was something very important that happened to me in the previous session. And he said, you all were saying to me that I'm talking as a therapist. I'm sorry. There was nothing of me talking as a therapist when I said what I said this to so and so. What he said to this woman was exactly this. You can love somebody at the same time that you let them go. But here's what he says there. He says, I said that, and suddenly I didn't know who had said that. <laughs> See, that's, that's the interesting thing. He said, I was, I said, did I say that? You remember today, it was beautiful, it was a beautiful, you know. And then he goes on, he says, oh, that has to be connected with what Macario told me two weeks before that. Why cannot I let him go? And so a lot of what he's working the group and the group was that. Here you have clearly the same thing. The utterance is what he says to the other patient. You can love somebody and let go. The enunciation is what he suddenly realizes. Did I say that? Somebody said that, the subject of the unconscious said that. That is the subject of the enunciation. And it was about him. Maybe he was speaking about Absolutely. Him. He was yeah. saying it to the patient, the other person. Right. It, it was about him. It was about himself. And, and he is he's working very well on that. And then he says, this has to be connected with what Dr. Gerardo told me. Why cannot I let him go? And so he asked me, I don't know. You tell me. So I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> he has to find out. I cannot tell him. <laughs> But I'm very interested. I'm going to continue working with that, you know. But but you see the difference between enunciation and, and statement. It happens all the time in therapy. All the time, and it's very easy to miss it. Extremely easy, especially if you are trained in a different way. It's it's uh, it's the most normal thing is to miss. That. No, uh, can you specify what in that statement you can love somebody and let them go? What is the enunciation and what is the statement? The statement is that phrase. Mm -hmm. You can love somebody and let go. The enunciation is what he says. Did I say that? Mm -hmm. When did I say that? How did that come into me? He says, I didn't think when I said that. That is the subject of the enunciation. So are you, you're equating the, the subject of the enunciation with the, the subject of the unconscious. The unconscious. Okay. What he says, you can love somebody and let go, that's ego. Yeah. That's ego. Okay. Okay. When he says, did I say that? How did I end up saying that? And he goes on and says, wow, I said that. Why did I say that? I didn't know I was saying that, but I said it. And he kept saying that in the group. He was saying, I, I knew I had said it, but I didn't know why I had said it. Mm -hmm. And then he begins to connect it with the question I had asked him. You know. So this is the subject of the unconscious. The subject of the enunciation is the subject of the unconscious. Okay. The subject of the statement is the ego. Okay. And so you could say the subject of the statement is not very aware of the commitment involved in the statement. Yes. And the uh, subject of the enunciation is precisely uh, with two feet in the commitment <laughs> of the statement. Exactly. Two feet in the commitment. That's good. And that's why he says, oh my goodness, did I say that? <laughs> and because now he's going to say, and so how can I love Dr. Geraldo and let him go? He's going to have to face that, you know. But he's a very healthy patient. Yeah, he's a, but I mean, he's, but he's, yeah, he's... Uh, to be like that. Yeah. Uh, 
Number two. He's worked very hard. The dilemma is the same, right? What? The dilemma is the same whether he's healthy or not. Right, right, right. <laughs> <I know. laughs> the dilemma is the same. Whether you know, Absolutely. that's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. Maybe not from my belly. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He still has to let you go. Okay. He still has to let you go. Right? Exactly, you know. <laughs> uh, that's work. When you see. Yeah. That brought your appetite, my belly, right? Are you sure you don't want to fall back one? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Certainly sprung some action. <laughs> now, so the next thing is, is the central issue with sadism. So the perverse subject is rigidified in the object. Object A on the left. And the bar subject is on the right, is on the other. Could you repeat that? Mm -hmm. The perverse subject is... The perverse subject is rigidified okay. in the object. Okay. Object R. <coughs> the bar subject is on the other side. Okay. okay. So on the left, you have the body. Mm -hmm. On the right, you have subjectification. You have the signifier. You have signification. You have meaning. There's no meaning on the left on that body. It is a piece of the rear. On the left, the subject that is in this position, he is the agent of torment. You say, you say torment or torment? Torment. Mm -hmm. right? torment. Torment, yeah. And the victim is on the other side. Okay. On the left, there is the in modesty of the one. On the right is the modesty of the other. The few pieces that I read which are absolutely awful. I mean, I, I said I won't read that tonight because it's, you know, but they are really, anyway. <laughs> uh, you mean the few pieces of Saad? Of Saad. His, his stories. The, the in modesty, I mean the, the way how this rose not only physically, but in words, the victim. That is the immodesty. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and so with the words, the, the actors in the Sadian uh, Maxim, they rape the other. So the immodesty of the one rapes the modesty of the other. And some of these analysts talk about how this is so much the case with the number of uh, classical perverts, like the serial killers. Uh, many of them are not psychotic, they are perverts, but with a, a, a perverse structure. And how they look for usually beautiful women, young and beautiful. And it is the pain and the suffering of this woman that is into the bar subject, you know, that brings their enjoyment, their pleasure, you know. And, and Lacan says something very interesting. He says that many of those writers before have said that the pervert chooses the beautiful woman because of the sexual attraction. And he says, nonsense. It isn't that. It is that that beauty is the veil before the horror. Mm -hmm. And that for the pervert to get to that point and cross from the beauty to the horror is some of the maximum pleasure of the pervert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is not a sexual attraction mm -hmm. per se. It's a, it's a very powerful thing that they say yes. about this. You know. Has anyone here seen the film Antichrist? No. What? Antichrist. Antichrist. It's by Lars von Trier. It's by who? Lars von, von Trier it, it won the Cannes Festival. Uh -huh. but it, it really represents, it, it really, there is a representation of that in the, in the torture of this couple who are actually both therapists uh -huh. and trying to heal themselves mm -hmm. go through. And it, it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. now you, you just saw mangled members, mangled bodies, mangled mm -hmm. palaces. And, it was just 
such an intense evil destructive effect that mm -hmm. nothing was bought from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend anyone see the film. Oh, right. <laughs> it's not a lot. Because it, 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 it really, I think in some sense, it really epitomizes this kind of statism that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you, anyone's interested to in the five, my recommendation, go ahead <laughs> and tell me about it. <laughs> And so the last line on that uh, the distinction between the perverse subject and the victim is that the perverse subject is dealing with the organ, with the body, with his enjoyment, uh, whereas on the other side, the other is barred. And I put uh, the big other is barred. The, the bar should go over the A, just the same as the before that, the bar over the S, but I didn't have any way. And now we'll move to the Mathene, so maybe about 15 minutes more and then take a break and maybe talk because otherwise it's too heavy to... You're going to keep this here on midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's plenty of material here and more. And uh, uh, again, if people want me to present again, I'll, I'll do another presentation. Oh, well, that would be great. Excellent. 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 Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think when you bring the examples from the practice, yes. I don't understand that. I have quality I mean, examples from, yeah, I have quality yeah. examples from Freud and, and also perverse traits, because there are perverse traits in all of us, you know, that's, you know, we, uh, there's uh, examples of sadism and masochism in every mm -hmm. human being. So, in neurosis, perverse traits are a means to get results. In perversion, it is a will to get results. That's the difference. It's a difference. And and that's what I was thinking. That's how I was thinking about this guy that uh, kidnapped this kid and killed the bus driver because here he is in this bunk bunker. Is it bunker? Yes, mm -hmm. bunker. With this this kid. Other thoughts I had that because this kid apparently is, it, it, it was autistic. I don't know how autistic. It mm -hmm. could be. It could be. I don't know. But maybe he didn't suffer as much. Mm -hmm. Because the autistic child is not as barred as the, as the regular neurotic child. Mm -hmm. So it could be that the child didn't suffer as much for the parents, parents the community. Mm -hmm. So that's the other bar. See? That's what the pervert, the pervert is trying to create the, the bar subject in the other, mm -hmm. not in himself. He is a piece of the real. But his function with the torment is to create the bar other in the victim. It seems that here the victim were primarily the parents, the community, certainly the child, but apparently, and I haven't read much of it, apparently, it seems that he, quotation marks, took good care of the child, allowed people to send food, mm -hmm. to send colors, and other things, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the other thing is that some of these pervers will sort of, uh, what is the word, be nice to the victim, or by the wife, and then yeah. gradually begin to get the victim into the pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is all part of the... Mm -hmm. To me, from the little I heard, this is a case exactly of a sadistic pervert, you mm -hmm. know, this guy, you know. Um, and no difficult, he gets into, can you imagine? The bus stop gets in, gives the rabbit, gets the child and runs to the, it's amazing. Uh, I have some examples from Freud, from one of the analysts here, very excellent, but I'll move to the first Mathene. That first mathem is the general mathem for the fantasy in, in uh, Lacan. That mathem is read the bar subject in relationship to object A. But the lozenge, notice, it can go either way. It can go from the bar S to the A or from the A to the S, meaning the subject, the subject in the position of the bar S 
can move to the position of being object A. The subject in the position of object A can move to the position of being bar subject. This is a central theme to talk about the sexual relationship, man and woman. In the regular sexual relationship, like I will say, the man is in the position of the bar subject. The woman is in the position of the object of desire. The man in love to the woman needs to get to be with the object, in the object. The, the man is trying to move to the second position. And what they explain here very well, this analysis, is that both the man in the position of the bar S and the woman in the position of object of desire, both have access to the phallic jouissance. The phallic jouissance is the jouissance of the bodies. That man, generally speaking, has greater difficulty moving beyond phallic jouissance. That man in general is stuck with the perverse trait. That man wants to get to the object and enjoy the organ. That the woman has access to the phallic jouissance, but has access to another jouissance. A jouissance that goes beyond that and that is supported by the signifier. And in Ancor, in Seminar 20, then Lacan is going to talk a lot about that. And so in this formula, it's also that famous sentence of Lacan, there is no sexual rapport. And what I understood now is that in the sexual relationship, both members of the relationship are in different positions structurally. They are not reciprocal. They are different. And it is because they are different that there can be the sexual relationship. But then also, in the clinic is very interesting. I, I have seen it recently in, in some of the work I'm doing. Just recently, there's a man that after the, the, a number of losses and, and relationships and so forth and deaths, etc., cetera, uh, meets this woman that seems to respond it's like a dream. And they both are very enamored and so forth, but he, he gets into the session extremely upset. He says, I'm good for nothing. The first time he tries to have intercourse with her, cannot make it, mm -hmm. cannot have the erection. See, this is very interesting in this fantasy. What happens here, he cannot move to A. He stays barred. The woman is so important to him, responds to so much of his desire that he gets frightened. Mm -hmm. So he stays barred and can have erection. So there are many clinical things that can be understood through this. Uh, through this, uh, the woman on the other side has access, as Lacan says, to the father's resistance. But thanks to the woman, she can help the man move to meaning, to signification, to the other resistance. You know. uh, it is harder for the man to get to that other resistance. It is much easier for the woman to get there. So that's the theme for fantasy. It says it's reversible, which means you can occupy either position. But even if you occupy either position, it's not reciprocal. They are different positions. Mm -hmm. 
And so the second theme is, is the desire of man uh, regulated by, by the fantasy. I basically talk about that right now. And now we move to the theme for perverse structure. So notice in the theme for perverse structure, the object, A, ah, is on the left, the bar subject on the right. The pervert subject occupies the place of the object. It starts from there. It's not barred. Doesn't have anxiety. Doesn't have lack. The perverse subject wants to create the lack, the bar in the other. And that's how the torment is going to be pure. Furthermore, under number three, in perversion, you have S. S is the subject that is not barred yet. So the, the pervert, because it, it's just an S, is going to occupy the place of, of the other, of the, not, not the other, not the, of the other. And then so it will go from the subject and try to create, but this is not reversible, by the way as opposed to the fantasy in the neurotic subject. Because the first, the formula of the fantasy, I forgot to say that, that is typical of neurosis with the lozenge, you know, that can go back and forth. Here, there's no back and forth. It's rigidified. Mm -hmm. The pervert is stuck on the left and needs to create that on the right. And the next mathem, what is, what is furthermore important, is behind this object of desire, it's a will commanding the desire of the, of the perfect. It's, you must do this and have no limit to the exactions that you capriciousness that, 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 that can create. Um, I went over lots of things. Yes. Uh, they are, they are all in that uh, in that mm. article, you know. And mm. I have selected a number of paragraphs which we could do next time. Yes, that's where we can get from the from those paragraphs and see how it is, it is exactly what we're talking about. Okay. <coughs> Curry, what, what what is the third thing at the bottom? What's that? Page? What is the third element uh, at the bottom? W A W is the will. Oh, that, that's that is the imperversion. All of that is is, is clarifying. But all, all all of those machines are the machine of perversion. You know? So, but the arrow of the object uh, is going towards will. No. No. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. It's because the will is behind that. The will is what is maintaining the object in the pervert. You know. And then from that object that is rigidified, you move to create the bar other. Basically, what, what we are saying is that behind the, this rigidified object position that the pervert takes, there is a will commanding him to act in the way he acts. As you're talking about this, I have a patient who's just entering into a sadomasochistic relationship. <clears throat> and what you're saying about the pervert is so much the man's position. Mm -hmm. He wants to be in charge. He tells her what to do. And if she gets pleasure, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's told her, you can't ask, you can't talk, you can't tell me anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we get around to sexual relationships, mm -hmm. in a sense you're the object and you have to do what I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's very, very, very clearly in, right. in this kind of Now it's very interesting in what you're saying, Edmund, because then uh, the thing about the perverse traits, because Lacan, different from Freud, Lacan says that the structure of the fantasy in the masochist uh, and not in the masochistic, in the masochistic structure is exactly the same. And he says it would appear contradictory because the masochist is the victim. Mm -hmm. So he says, ah, but read masoch. Masoch 
would order his wife to whip him, mm -hmm. to hurt him, to get him suffer. That's how he would get the pleasure. But he was in charge of the mm -hmm. torment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's in charge. And the wife mm -hmm. says that the, the memoirs of the wife, she talked about her pain, her anxiety, her not knowing, but she did it out of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. She did it she out of is. love. But see, the, the, there you have the bar other on the other side and the masochist, even though it would appear as if it is the victim, no, mm -hmm. it is not. He's in control. He's in control. Yeah. Yes. And to help meditate, what do you ask the masochist? What do I ask? What do you ask the masochistic patient so that they can start to realize that a certain perfection, a certain control is part of the I don't know if to ask, but I can remember from some time ago a woman who had a very sadistic mother, a horrendous, uh, a Latin American woman, and, uh, and she would whip this girl mercilessly, and the brothers would watch, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't say anything. And this girl would not shed a tear or scream or nothing. She would say, I am not going to give her the pleasure of seeing me in pain. Mm -hmm. It's the stoic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the stoic is a very bad victim for a sadist. Mm -hmm. Very bad victim because the stoic doesn't let the tormentor yeah. Yeah. About subject. yeah. But then, of course, this was reflected in some of her issues. And she would have dreams where she was in that position. Of the mother. Of, and, and the victim. Yeah. And usually there was a threesome there, you know. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, what do you ask of the patient? I don't think so much what you ask, but what you find from the material and what you point out so that she, he can reconstruct the fundamental fantasy that we were talking about. And in the end, it is going to be he or she that has to cross that fantasy. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to let that go. Mm -hmm. Because it is a piece of the real. It is not just meaning. It's not symbolization. It's a piece of the real. And, you know. So in this, in this woman's fantasy, or her dreams, she was both the mother she was Victim and observer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she, she was sometimes one, she was sometimes the other. Okay. But they, 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 they she would change places. Right. So she, she was working with her with her issues. Mm -hmm. you know, she was exactly trying to, mm -hmm. to, to work in her history. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get to the two schemas. Uh, you have the invitation. Yeah. yeah. The interesting thing about Sal is that in his life, he was a victim. Mm. He was more the victim than the tormentor. The tormentor was uh, his mother-in-law. Mm. <laughs> mother-in-law. <laughs> How did, how did that play out? The mother-in-law was extremely harsh with him and, uh, and got the police and the judges after him. And he spent 15 years in the Bastille, in prison. He was an aristocrat, a writer, a philosopher, you know, and so forth. You know. And he, he, he had perversions, you know. He, he was uh, sexually, he had perversions. But he, from what everything I, I read from it, because I haven't read those works, I don't know if I have the guts to read them, but everything that I can do, you know. But from what all of these analysts say, that in fact, basically, Sal was a neurotic, not a pervert. Mm -hmm. His books talk about perversion. Mm -hmm. But in fact, his writings 
from what I hear, have been tremendously influential with artists and films mm -hmm. uh, because of the rebellion, because of the pointing out the hypocrisy and, the, and, and, and what lies behind uh, mm -hmm. in, in the human being. So it's a very interesting. Thing. Well, thank you so much, Macario. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Very impressive. Very impressive. Very and uh, next time, uh, selecting texts of. Uh, yeah. Of so next time we can get the yeah, yeah. To the article, uh -huh. and then we can get to certain key paragraphs, and then we'll see there how they connect with what we were talking about today. You know, and then we can we can get more into the fantasy and castration. Yeah. How is that? And then uh, uh, the third section may be more clinical. Yeah. Examples from you and from anybody else. Right, yeah. And you have a patient who is alternatively sadomasochistic and uh, at the same time paranoid and so... Uh, oh, that's quite a bit there. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right.